cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I'm in the midst of lions. I'm forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Good to see you. Fantastic to uh, turn to this psalm. So as you note there, we've got it there on the, uh, uh, the screen for you. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background again, uh, this is part of the second book of Psalms. Psalms has got five books. It probably, I guess, mimics the five books of the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament. This second book is a very, very interesting one because it um, got a lot of repetition actually from the first uh, book of Psalms, but with a very particular slant. And it's very aware of um, the fact that we have longings in our hearts. And that uh, we are looking for a world that we don't experience day by day by day. So Psalm 42, 43, that actually introduces this entire second part of the Psalms, really captures that reality. When it says, why are you so disturbed within me, O my soul? Why so restless? Can you resonate with that? And then he says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. It's very much an entire block of material that is very aware that we are not living in a world that is an easy place to live in. That we are not living in a world that naturally correspond with our hearts. Um, and that life is complicated and it's broken. And JJ has uh, reminded us this morning about that reality, these weird things that happen in our world. Four kids get saved after 40 days and other people not. And then there's all the other disasters that we don't even know about. And it's confusing, isn't it? It's, it's complicated to work it out, to figure out where you sit within all of that. Um, and the Psalms are really written, I take it, as a way for us to process our realities, our experiences of life. And David, obviously the great uh, psalmist, uh, often uses his own background, uh, and sometimes he doesn't. So in this psalm, we actually are told. Uh, this is when he fled from Saul into a cave. So it's, uh, the, David kind of ended up in caves quite a bit, so we're not sure exactly where, which, which of these caves he's referring to. Uh, but it does seem like it is in about 1 Samuel 22, He's just come from Gath. That was our previous psalm, Psalm 56. He has escaped from there. And then he runs into the cave of Abdullam. And, and he then goes into uh, non-Christian territory. And even finds solace from the king of Mohan. Um, and he's in this cave. And really weird things happening in this cave. 400 people who are discontent and owes a lot of money joins him. It's really weird when you read the details of what's going on. Um, and in this section of the Psalms, you'll notice there's a couple of interesting things if you are interested in these details. Why they are like this, we don't really know. It's a bit more guesswork. Uh, but there's a no, number of Psalms that it's all about David facing his enemies. Uh, and he faces his enemies many times. And so it's not a new thing, but these Psalms are actually all written together. Um, and six of them, six of the seven are miktams, and nobody knows what the miktam is. Uh, can, some people think it's a musical instrument, but it seems like the research is being done that it's got a different connotation. It actually is something that covers. Now, I don't know what it covers. That's the interesting thing. So you can go and figure those things out. And it has got a tune of Do Not Destroy. So the next three psalms all have that 
tune. No, we don't know if it's a tune. It just says, don't, do not destroy. A phrase that comes up quite a number of times. Um, and it seems like it always seems to come up in the prophets where God says, I will not destroy my people. Um, ultimately, I will save. And so maybe that's the reflection. There's a lot of guesswork here. We are not told the whole lot of stuff. There are four Psalms with that heading. Do not destroy. Three of them come right next to one another. And then only in Psalm 75, which is actually in the next book of Psalms. Uh, it does another one that has do not destroy. So for those of you who really like to spend your Sunday afternoons wrestling with things that we don't know, there are some conundrums for you to go and uh, figure out. But here, David is in the midst of his running away from Saul. The first part of David's life um, seems to be quite hectic and he seems to be running all the time and he's getting most of his rejection from God's people themselves actually from the king of Israel from Saul and David is wrestling with all of this stuff and you're going to see next week it gets a little bit more hairy so if you really are feel like uh, you are into a heavy stuff then next week is a good psalm to come back to he's going to wrestle with this here he introduces us to where his heart is it's like JJ said and this is an incredibly positive psalm in a psalm of great faith, a psalm of great confidence in God. And we'll notice as you read the psalms that David is not always there. Sometimes he's right up there, and sometimes he's not. He's down in the dumps, and he doesn't know what's going on. And so, welcome this morning if you're a human being. <laughs> sometimes you're up there, you've got great confidence in the Lord, you're strong, your mind is clear, your heart is clear, and other times... <laughs> you don't know what's going on. Psalm 42, 43. Three times in that refrain, I don't know what is going on in me. I am depressed, I'm overwhelmed, and I don't know what to do. But when I don't know what to do, there's always something you can do. You can praise the Lord. How many of you find it easy to do that? So this is the one thing you can always do when you don't know what to do, you can praise the Lord. Get kind of New Testament picks this up. So this is a really a reflection of a New Testament idea One in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, 16, anyone can remember? Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This psalm is a perfect example of somebody who's done it in a very particular situation. That's really what's going on in this psalm. So it's a psalm that actually picks up on this reality. And David is in trouble. He's overwhelmed. Um, he's afraid. And yet he actually tells us, I've been working through this and my mind is being shaped by what I know. And I'm applying that. Uh, to this very specific situation. So the psalm just quickly. Okay, so that's just the introduction. So he's helping us. So for some of us, this psalm is uh, something to aspire to. And for some of us, we may be here. Some of us are well trained in worshipping God when the wheels come off. And David does this. And we'll see how interesting he does this. So the psalm really breaks itself up into two very, very similar sections. Uh, verses 1 to 5, ending in this exaltation, be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. And then again in verse 11, exactly the same. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. And that, I take it, is the desire, the longing of every single person who loves truth and who loves grace. When God is finally exalted above the heavens, because He's greater than the heavens, and His glory is here on earth, that's when it's going to be good. Anything before that will go through this ups and down. There will be times when things are good, and there will be times when things are down. Until this happens, that's when it will be finally done. And so the question is, how much do you long for that? And how confident are you that that's going to happen? I mean, that's really what the psalm is wrestling with. So when my life, when the things that happen to me in life hits me, 
what always will happen to you, and we'll see that in all the Psalms really, your heart is revealed to you. And your heart is what your deepest longings and convictions and values are. That's your heart really. It's the center of your being. So when life hits you, that's when your heart is revealed. And that's a good thing, isn't it? Because we'll see here that even when your heart reveals to you that you are in desperate need and you can't do anything about it, it will reveal to you who you will turn to in that moment. And you always can turn to the Lord. And that's really what David is actually doing in this very, very short little psalm. But it's profoundly uh, difficult to actually arrive here at all times. David is at this stage, while he's in this cave, uh, this is where he is. He says, well, I've worked this through. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my God. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the deductions that I've made. So that you may yourself may be joining me. So David is uh, declaring stuff. David is begging stuff. David is talking to himself. <laughs> do, you, do you do that? Do you talk to yourself? What do you say to yourself? Interesting, isn't it? We all do that. I take it. The one person you actually listen to the most is yourself. Wherever you go, you're, you're talking. You're talking to yourself. You're analyzing, you're debating, you're deducting, you're making promises, you get frustrated. You're talking to yourself all the time. And so the Psalms are brilliant because they actually take us through this process that we sometimes go through as we try and make sense of where am I going to turn when I'm in this situation or in something similar. And so let's have a quick squiz. So the first section, he builds up towards this confidence in God, but he's got confidence already because he's crying out. Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me. The word really is not technically mercy. I don't know why the translation is actually grace. Now, uh, yeah, just for those who are Afrikaans, an Afrikaans is not net genade. <laughs> and that, there is no mercy and grace. We don't have two words. We only have one word. <laughs> right? Which is, I guess is fine. Mercy is more linked to sin. Lord, do not deal with me according to my sin. Have mercy on me. Where grace is, is a bit bigger. Do me good. Be favorable towards me despite the situation. Which is very often very closely connected. So here David, at least as far as we know, haven't sinned directly. For why he's in this situation. It's because he's God's king and Saul doesn't want him to be. So he's really saying, Lord, be gracious to me. Be gracious to me. For I find you as my ultimate Hiding place, my refuge. And he's going to tell us in verse 9, I'm sorry, in verse, in verse 7, he's going to tell us that in his heart, he always goes to God. His heart goes to him. So when he says, you are my refuge, there's no way. He's in a cave, remember? He's not. He's outside the land. He's outside the promised land. He's away from everything that's familiar. And he says, I find you as my refuge. Because I can call on you at all times because you are not localized. You are the one who's above the heavens and over all the earth. I won't only find you in one place. I can find you everywhere. Because in one sense you are everywhere. See how interesting this is? So, you know, how do you think about God? Is He everywhere or is He only some places? And in a moment of stress, it will be revealed to you what you believe in that moment. Whether God is everywhere or He's not. And He says, you are the place that I always go to. You are my hiding place. You are my refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. So here He says, well, I'm living in your world. And the imagery is beautiful. There's lots of places where it goes, you know, the mother hen that covers her chicks with her wings. That's the idea. You also have the cherubim. And the, and the Ark of the Covenant that covers the Ark of the Covenant with their wings uh, under the protection of God. And he's saying, well, wherever I go in this world, I'm always under your wings. There is not a single place where you are not God. And therefore, I'll hide with you because I can find you anywhere and you are everywhere. And that's my conviction. And then that little phrase, until the disaster has passed, uh, the language is a little bit different. It says, up until... All disasters have passed. It's actually plural. 
So David is saying, I am going, at this moment I'm finding here, but actually, whatever disaster may come, I will come to you all the time, because you will cover me with your wings, and all disasters will pass. When you're in trouble, when you're in pain, when your life is upside down, do you remember it's temporal? It feels eternal, isn't it? When you suffer, you think, how long, O oh Lord? It's a question we often ask. And the Psalms often verbalize that question. David says, well, at this moment, I am so convinced that it doesn't matter what calamities I am having, what kind of dark places he's talking about, it will pass. Now that's amazing confidence, isn't it? It will pass away, because there's only one being that is forever, and that's God himself. And since he is who he is, and we're going to see that now, what is he like? What is his nature? What is his character like? Well, he takes you through these dark places. We'll see that now. How we expect. You see how beautiful this is? So this first little line is just helping us. I mean, we all go through, and it's possible, <laughs> says David, to arrive at a place where you say, I will always run to the Lord. I will always be under His wings. And I will be under His wings when all, until all disasters have passed. Pretty confident at this moment is our brother David. And then he says, I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. So he's saying, I'm crying out to the highest of high gods. We had a bit of a discussion in our Genesis studies about the name God and El Elyon and all sorts of things. Here he says, of all the gods, of all the spiritual beings in the universe, I am calling out to the highest one. He is the one who controls everything. And then he says, our translation says, to the God who vindicates me. Really, it's a, again, the language can be slightly different. He says, I call out unto the most high God, who will take me through all my steps until I reach the ultimate destination. That's good news. So every day of your life, God is busy taking you through some of your steps. He's busy working you so that you will be able to go through the steps, through the experiences that you need to go through, to get where he wants you to be. It means he's busy with the process. Isn't it what he's saying? We're all in process. Right? He's saying, God is taking me through these steps. And he is going to get me to the end. I have got not the faintest idea what the next step is. And I don't know how long it will be. But I know it will pass. He's just said it. And I know God will take me through the steps. He will get me there. The New Testament says it. He who began a good work in you will bring it until it is completed. So you are under construction. Your heart is under construction. Your entire being is under construction, says David. I have discovered that. And I want to give myself to that reconstructing process that God is busy with. So when you look at something... You can either look at it, this is disastrous and it's bad and I must do everything in my power to get out of it. Or you can say, well, this is under God's hand and I will ask him to help me to take me through all the steps necessary so that I can get out of it. One is battling to fair faith, the other one is having faith, isn't it? God's process is to get you to recognize that he's God no matter what hardship you find yourself in. Because hardships are temporal, God is eternal. Will you go to him, trust him, wrestle with him, walk with him in the midst of these things? That's what David is kind of saying. He's sort of setting it all out in this little section for us. Amazing, isn't it? But not easily arrived at. Not an easy place to get to, I take it. And so, he says, he sends from heaven and saves me. He is the one who intervenes from outside of my world. And he brings me deliverance. 
in this case, he will rebuke those who are hotly pursuing me. And God ultimately does that. God sends forth, and here it comes. What does God send forth in order to bring about salvation? Look at what he says. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. Is that right? Yeah. First word, love, is chesed. And we all know exactly what that means. Chesed is God's gracious, covenantal loyalty. It means when God says something, he cannot but keep it. Remember that when he made that covenant with Abraham just to help us in our weakness. Normally when you made a covenant in the Old Testament, it was much more dangerous than today. Today we sign with our signature on this piece of paper. In those days, what you did is you took a couple of animals and you actually cut them in half and you put the halves of the animals across one another. About four or five animals. And then you would walk in between those animals declaring, if I break my word, you can do to me what has been done to these animals. Anyone want to make a covenant? <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of sick. Literally, it meant cutting a covenant. That's what the word means. And so, when God makes to Abram a covenant that he is going to bless the entire world through his offspring, God cuts a whole bunch of animals and he alone walks between those animals. And he says to Abram, If I break my word, you can cut me too. Now, I'm not sure. <laughs> Who's going to do the cutting in that case? But isn't that amazing? God is actually giving for Abram a very, very vivid picture of the fact that I cannot break my word. I am not like a human. It is impossible for me not to keep my word. And here is the evidence of me doing it. And he says, will you send forth your gracious covenantal Loyalty. I know you will. God sends its forth. The reason why this universe is being upheld is because God is upholding it with the power of his word. And you go back to all the covenants. I will bring enmity between man and Satan. To those who are my people and those who are Satan's people. There will be enmity. So you can be guaranteed there's going to be war. It says it. But despite that war, I will actually uphold this world and I will bring about my purposes. And I will call people from in that world that are suffering to cry out to me and I will give them my love. I will give them my covenant commitment. I, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what God is busy doing, isn't it? And they would say, well, you're doing it. So keep doing it, Lord. So send forth this unbelievable, gracious, covenantal commitment Keep doing it. And your faithfulness, which is in literal terms, your truth. Send forth your truth. The truth that only you can uphold this world. None of what we can do can uphold this world. Only you can save. No one else can save. Only you are the one who truly understands we don't. And so he's saying, well, this is what we need. We need literally God's engagement all the time. And he thanks God that this is what he's going to do. And he's doing it in the midst of... Verse 4, he describes for us, and we're going to pick that up, verse 4, next week. For those of you who want to come back, we're going to look a bit more detail. Here in this context, he's saying, one of the worst things that you can experience in life is when people malign you and go for your character and try and destroy you with their words. And that's really what he's talking about in this immediate context. I'm laughed at, I'm mocked, I'm, all sorts of lies are being told about me, uh, he says, that's my context that I'm in. But in the midst of that, he's saying to God, you do your thing. You take me through this because this will come to an end. Because of your covenantal commitment and your truth will get me through this. And then he bursts out, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. That's what I ultimately want. I ultimately want you to be glorified. I want you to reign this entire world, the heavens and earth, belongs to you. We pray that every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. May your 
name be glorified. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's all summarized in that one verse. Beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful prayer, beautiful longing, beautiful hope, beautiful thing to look forward to, that God would do that. And David says, well, I'm, this is where I am at the moment. And then he reverts back in verse 6, they spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my, in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. You find this basic thing, whatever you sow, you reap. So if you're going to sow against God's people, you will reap God's judgment. You pick that themes up right through the New Testament over and over again. God will pay back trouble to those who have troubled you, says Paul to the Thessalonians. Fascinating language. No one ever escapes anything. God is the only one who can actually sort that out. And that's why it's the right place for you now to go to him. And here he comes. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. I have set my heart on you. At the moment, my heart is absolutely sure that this is who you are. So this is where I am. I'm steadfast. I'm settled. What an incredible statement, isn't it? I'm not fluctuating. I'm not moving around. I'm settled. Boom. My heart is settled on this. Incredible. My heart is settled that this is who you are. My heart is settled that you will bring about your kingdom. My heart is settled that you are the one who must do it. I'll wait for you. Not an easy place to be. It takes a lot of wrestling with yourself. It takes a lot of wrestling with God even to get there. And now he says, now he's starting to talk to himself again. All right? So first talks to God and now he talks to himself. Wake up! Oh, so actually the word says, wake up my glory. It's one of those interesting. You're not sure if it's uh, if he's talking about God is his glory or his own glory. He says, wake up. Wake up, harp and liar. I will awaken the dawn. I'm going to start singing while it is still dark. Jackie is one of those people that sings at three o'clock. <laughs> In the mornings. And then she comes and plays me the songs that she sang at 3 o'clock in the morning. I will sing while it is dark. Isn't that fascinating? <coughs> I won't wait until my circumstances have changed before I declare God's glory and God's grace and God's truth. I will declare it while I'm in the dark. That's faith, isn't it? You see, he's, he's doing this in the midst of this. So not when it's past. While he's doing it, he says, that's the right reaction. That's what I want to do. That's, that's what you deserve, God. Interesting is, that is exactly the process that God is taking each one of us through. God wants each one of us to declare his glory before we can see his glory. He wants us to declare His goodness from our hearts because we believe that He's good before we can see that He's good. Because the ultimate, the fundamental reason why man has fallen into sin, you all know, is because man doubted God's goodness. You will discover that every hardship will stir in your heart the temptation to believe God is not as good as he says he is. That's the natural human reaction. Amazing, isn't it? And as David is wrestling with this, he's saying, huh, I'm going to wake myself up. I'm going to tell myself to do what I know is true, even though I don't sense it. I don't feel it, I don't see it, I don't experience it. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to declare Him. I will praise, verse 9, I'll praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing to you among 
the peoples. I will praise you. It's interesting. He says, I will speak so truthfully, accurately about who you are before all those who don't know you. And that's literally where he is. He's outside of Israel. He's among a bunch of uh, non-Jewish people at this moment. He says, I will accurately say who you are and declare it so that everyone may hear it. And then I'll make a lot of noise. It is difficult, isn't it? That's why Sunday morning service is so vital, isn't it? You come in here, you've got a bit of droopy feet, droopy heart, and then you sing some of these songs and they just... just stir something in your heart. And you're like, yeah, man, I know that's true, but keepers, I don't find it easy. So one of the ways in which you can stir up what you know to be true, so that your heart will express it, is to sing. I mean, that's one of the things that God has given us. And he says, I'm going to declare. So you can really start there. And only years ago, Sean said that. Here's one of the most interesting things. Whenever you are in trouble, start to tell yourself, what do you believe about God? He's very small. He doesn't care. He doesn't decide anything. He leaves everything up to us. All right? That's our tendency, isn't it, in that moment? What does your heart declare to you about what do you believe to be true about God in all the covenants that he's made? And that's what David is wrestling with. So he's sure, he's happy, and yet he says, I've got to wake myself up. I've got to get myself there because I am not there. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. There's again your chesed, your covenant commitment. The heavens are there because God is covenantally committed to keep the heavens there. The earth is here because God covenantally keeps the fact that the earth is here. And your faithfulness, your truth reaches to the skies. As far as I can look, now here's the interesting thing. When your life falls apart, for whatever reason, why do I look away from me? Because, despite the fact that my life falls apart, what is still true? Life doesn't fall apart. Did you notice the sun came up this morning despite how you felt? not connected to how you feel. Your life may fall apart. Absolutely. And it can happen. I mean, David is here running for his life. But he says, because I look away and I see this enormous world upheld by God's covenantal faithfulness and truth, when my life falls apart, I remind myself that life doesn't fall apart. Because there's a God that upholds all of life. Now that... <laughs> You don't arrive at that easily, do you? Keep on hampering at that because that's the entire second book of Psalms is involved with this wrestle for what we hope and for what we long and what we can anticipate and what we can see but we don't experience in its fullness. We all are longing for the fullness of God's kingdom, isn't it? We're looking for that place where there's no more tears, no more fear, no more sin, no more brokenness. No more hatred. No more death. You're all looking for that world, aren't you? In the midst of this world, I come and go, but life doesn't come and go. God of it. So will you trust Him in getting you where you need to be in this big picture of what God is busy doing? That's what David at this stage seems to be fairly confident about, and that's why he ends. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. Oh, how I long for all of this to actually be. This is the cry of my heart when I am in the darkness. And I'm going to wake myself up and I'm going to start screaming because the light is coming. God has not abandoned this world even though it may feel he's abandoned me. I know that he is the one. 
that will change that. In this psalm, whole psalm, I mean, quite obvious where it fits in, isn't it? When Jesus Christ came, he came <coughs> full of grace. grace and truth. Where did he come from? Up the heavens. You send forth from the heavens. You send your grace and your truth to infect life on earth. And in the end, you will bring it all back together again. Isn't that what we believe? That there's one person in this universe that can actually fulfill all the desires of a human heart. And all the desires of all human hearts. He's come from heaven. He's come to earth. He's infected the earth with his grace and with his truth. And he will sum it all up again when he comes again. And that's David's great joy. And that's our joy, isn't it? So now we see not everything yet under the rulership of Jesus Christ. But we see Jesus. Who overcame and conquered every single thing. And he said, put your trust in me and you will actually experience that reality. So have you been a little bit encouraged to wrestle? Maybe you are still stuck in Psalm 42. Why are you so disturbed within you? He's talking to himself. Maybe you don't know why you're disturbed. It's okay to be disturbed. You don't have everything in your hands. Wrestle. With the reality of God. But I'll put my hope in God. For I will yet praise Him. My Savior and my God. Sometime in the future I'm going to praise Him again. Flat out. But I'm going to start while it's dark. And that's what He encourages us to do. So how far are you in the process of reacting to your darknesses, to your confusion, to your hurt, to your burdens with starting to play this through your head so that you may arrive increasingly at I am going to worship him because of who he is and what he's done and what he will be that's what David's actually encouraging us I take it so let's take one another's hands and help one another along the road Speak your pain. Speak your frustration. Lots of the Psalms actually do that. But also speak to yourself about the truth and the reality and the goodness of God. And then play off the two against one another. Which one weighs the heaviest? Which one has got the most reality and truth to it? You or the Lord? And that is the process that he's taking us. And he's going to get us there. That's the good news. Let's pray together. Mm. Yes, Lord, we want to echo the words of David. Be gracious to us, O Lord. Be gracious to us. <clears throat> For we want to take our refuge in you. We want to hide in the shadow of your wings, in the shadow of all of your promises in Christ Jesus. Up until when all disasters come to an end. Lord, and there are many. So we thank you for the lessons you have taught us over the years and are currently teaching us. That we are very, very small. And our abilities are very, very low. But we will know the one who upholds all things. So our longing is, Lord, that you will be exalted. You will be who you are. You will be known for who you are. That every tongue will confess you as Lord. As God. As God most high. As all powerful one. And may your glory, your splendor, your holiness... Your kindness, your truth, your forgiveness, your power, your weakness. May your glory be over all the earth. How we long, Lord, for a world that is not so mad as the one that we are living in. So 
So we pray. Be gracious to us. Enable us, Lord, to go through the steps that you are taking us through. Help us to place our hand in your hand. And help us to walk through this world, this life. So that we may indeed receive from you everything necessary for life and godliness. So I pray, Lord, for everyone here, for every single person, for those who may know you, may not know you, those who are wrestling currently, those who think, I'm not sure I'm ever going to get here. We pray that you will be gracious. Because you, Lord, can change our hearts and our dispositions in the blink of an eye. So we bring ourselves to you. We want our hearts to be steadfast in the midst of trials. We even want to go as far as <clears throat> James says we should go. We should consider it all joy when we suffer trials of many kinds. Lord, most of us aren't there. <clears throat> most of us are still battling to do that. But thank you that that is a possibility. Thank you that we can see it in this instance in David's life. Thank you for the times that we have managed to praise you and to hold on to you. And it felt like our life was falling apart. Thank you that we can be engaging with you, a God who is above the heavens, and yet a God who is intimately concerned with our every prayer and our every concern. Thank you that you can bow down to the humble. Thank you that you reveal yourself to those who acknowledge their need and your glory. And we pray that you may do that this morning for each one of us. So that we may grow stronger in our ability to have more and more joy and rejoicing and prayer and giving thanks in all circumstances. For this is your will for us. This is your plan for us. This is the next steps until we reach that maturity that is Christ's. So thank you. Thank you that there's a purpose in the madness of this world. There's a purpose in our pain. There's a purpose in our wrestle. There's a purpose in our confusion. Thank you that you are the one who is an, can enable us to grow into the reality that you have set for us in Christ Jesus. So be merciful to us, Lord. Be gracious to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.